Uh, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, you're all very welcome um, this afternoon um, to the Institute for what I know is going to be a very um, interesting and um, stimulating talk by our distinguished um, visitor, David Parker. Um, first of all, though, I'd like to welcome Ambassador Burgess um, and his team and members of the Minister's team uh, who are here from New Zealand. You're all uh, extremely welcome also uh, uh, to be here um, uh, with us in Dublin uh, today. Um, and I'd like to just take the opportunity to thank the Embassy of New Zealand for their co-organisation of this event with the Institute um, this afternoon. David Parker um, is by, by profession and by training a lawyer. Um, he is um, a member of Jacinta Ardern's Government of New Zealand. He holds four portfolios, no less or no fewer, I should say, than four portfolios. Um, he has been Minister of Environment, Minister for Trade and Export Growth, Attorney General uh, and Associate Minister of Finance. But during his term um, in government, he has overseen the negotiation and ratification of the Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement uh, for Trans-Pacific Partnership, that trade agreement um, for New Zealand. He's presided over changes uh, to the law governing foreign investment in this country. We had a brief chat about some very interesting initiatives that he has taken and his government have taken uh, in New Zealand. And he's leading, amongst many other things, um, his country's efforts to improve water quality um, in the rivers and lakes. Uh, of that great country. So he is a awful lot on his plate. He's a very interesting man. He's got much to say. We're delighted to have him here this afternoon. David Parker. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, all politicians have got much to say. <laughs> we live and die by it, so we shouldn't apologise for it. Thanks, everyone, for coming along this afternoon. Um, it's great to have the opportunity to be uh, amongst you this afternoon, and it's a genuine pleasure to be in Dublin. I, I uh, lived in the UK for a while. I'm ashamed to say that I've never been to Dublin before. Isn't that a terrible admission? So I'll, I'll make that admission before I'm asked. <laughs> um, as many of you are aware, New Zealand's recently opened a Dub uh, an embassy in, in Dublin. Brad's our ambassador. Uh, and uh, you've opened one in Wellington. And it surprises some uh, that we haven't done that uh, earlier because we really do have a long-standing relationship uh, the contribution of Irish migrants made to the New Zealand story, going back to the early settlement and the gold rush days, um, uh, is very much part of our national fabric. Uh, in 1840, uh, which is at the start of really European colonisation of uh, New Zealand, William Hobson, hailing from Waterford, signed New Zealand's founding document, the Treaty of Waitangi. Just 65 years later, about 1905, Dave Gallagher, a hero of the sports and battlefields who's now mem memorialised in bronze in Donegal, kept in the original All Blacks. In the 1980s, New Zealand stood shoulder to shoulder with Ireland in helping to bring an end uh, to the troubles by establishing the International Fund for Ireland. Uh, at the same time, many of Ireland's agricultural leaders of this generation were uh, advancing their uh, trade on New Zealand farms. Uh, from 2011 onwards, Irish tradespeople seeking prosperity in the aftermath of a crisis at home helped New Zealand rebuild a devastated Christchurch that a lot of uh, Irish tradespeople came and helped out. And just uh, 60 days ago, the Taoiseach stood with New Zealand Prime Minister Ardern in Paris, rejecting hate-inspired uh, tax on anyone, particularly on New Zealanders pr practising their faith in Christchurch and both committed to tackle online uh, violent extremist content. Our similarities in size, population, geography, our rich natural capital and resulting strengths, these are all often cited as reasons for closeness between uh, Ireland and New Zealand. One in six New Zealanders claim uh, Irish heritage, including my own partner, she's uh, uh, of Irish extraction. But the connection runs uh, much deeper than this. It's a sense of uh, connected identity and shared outlook on life, common values, uh, the rule of law, democracy, independent courts, public health and education systems funded by levels of taxation that are needed to sustain them, 
these, uh, I think, really are the true underpinnings of similarities. I think it's why New Zealanders feel at home in Ireland, and I think Irish people feel at home in New Zealand. Uh, and all of this is what's driven a meaningful uh, global partnership between New Zealand and Ireland. Uh, it's underpinned by a number of things. Uh, we both lead in the new agenda coalition to combat nuclear proliferation. Uh, we are both responsible for the creation of the Small Advanced Economies Group that cultivates policy exchange learnings and aspirations to do better amongst small successful economies. And it's why Ireland stood with New Zealand and Paris signing up to the Christchurch call. All of these are global challenges, some of them are crises. All of them are examples of New Zealand and Ireland working together to rise to those challenges. Uh, there are two uh, issues that uh, currently weigh heavily upon me in my uh, roles as Minister for Trade and Export, Growth and Environment, and I'll spend a bit of time on those. Firstly, trade. There can be no doubt that the outlook for global trade is the darkest that I can remember in all my years of public service. Forty new trade restrictions alone in the last 60, uh, six months introduced by G20 economies. They affect half a trillion dollars in exports. Uh, in the last two years, we've seen the highest rate of increase in protectionist measures since the WTO was established. Even in the engine room of growth, uh, the Asia-Pacific economies, um, and I, and I say that because so much of the world's growth is actually now coming out of China and some of the countries that, it, that, it, uh, that surround it. Um, even in those countries, there's been a 74% increase in the number of non-tariff barriers in the region between 2004 and 2015. And this is bad news for small, dynamic, internationally dependent economies like uh, Ireland and New Zealand. We've got much on our plates managing the challenges of Brexit, navigating global power tensions, trying to sidestep collateral damage while encouraging dialogue and standing up for our own principles. We're mounting yet another effort, this time at the 11th hour, to safeguard and strengthen the WTO in Geneva. Uh, and uh, you know, there's, me there's many other things I could list that are not going quite right in trade. The stakes are significant, for, I think, for the global economy and actually in the long term for peace. Uh, but they're also significant for, particularly significant for trading nations like ours. Part of the response strays at, starts at home. There's been a fraying domestic consensus in many countries uh, in respect of trade, and New Zealand hasn't been immune for this. And when TPP was signed, which was the precursor to CPTPP, we had tens of thousands of protesters blocking motorways in New Zealand. So we haven't been immune to this. And when we came to power, I was of a view, personally and politically, that a lot of this was born of uh, complex factors which related to the insecurity of the middle class. That in itself had a lot of causes, the digital disruption to so many occupations, uh, the, so much wealth going to the 1% around the wealth, including in our own countries. Uh, Panama Papers showing that those people pay little, some of those people pay very little tax anywhere. Um, uh, uh, unsettling things happening through uh, extremes on social media, which are not, not yet under control in any democracy. Uh, the GFC and the flow-on effects of that on incredibly low interest rates, enabling people who already had assets to leverage them and buy more, uh, uh, and uh, excluding others. Uh, uh, the, the sense that trade agreements were for multinationals rather than ordinary people, and some of the provisions in agreements like international uh, dispute settlement clauses, which were seen as conferring greater rights on foreign multinationals than local corporates would have in respect of uh, disputes with their own government. Uh, so we, we've, we've chosen to deal with those issues, and we've been remarkably effective, actually, at, in my opinion, in this. We've, we've really had a genuine dialogue with New Zealanders on these issues, and we've tried to unpick them, unpick the issues and have responses to the individual issues rather than let trade be blamed for all of these things, which is all too easy to do. And we're doing this under the umbrella of a trade for all policy that tries to ensure that trade agreements and trade deliver outcomes for as many people as possible, flowing th right through the economy. We're trying to improve the participation of women and businesses owned by women in trade, not just in delegations, but in exports. 
um, of indigenous Maori people of rural communities of small to medium enterprises. Uh, so we've got an independent trade for all advisory board which is drawn from people including our critics uh, that makes recommendations to government. Now we're not upending core things, we continue to be fiercely fierce advocates for free and open global markets. Our efforts to lead an inclusive trade agenda, uh, agenda are intensifying, including with like-minded nations. We've got an inclusive action, a trade action group with Chile and Canada. Uh, we also work hard to curb environmentally harmful subsidies, including through trade agreements. And these are things uh, that we must uh, do better on, uh, as well as communicating more effectively why international trade is so vital to New Zealand's economy. Uh, we try to uh, convince people that globalisation is an irresistible force and that technological change too is something that ought to be embraced, uh, not, uh, uh, not to try and build shields from it. You've got to deal with the consequences of future, the future of work rather than pretending that those uh, issues aren't coming at us. So when we're talking with New Zealanders about trade, uh, it, of, it, uh, at the moment in New Zealand it turns to uh, the EU trade agreement. Many New Zealanders are surprised that we've only now just got around to negotiating an agreement with the European Union. We can re understand that reaction because it's out of step with, uh, with the close partnership that we already have around disarmament, environmental protection, climate change leadership, standing up for human rights, dealing with cyber security issues, data privacy issues and more uh, broadly cooperating in global bodies, whether they be in New York, Geneva or elsewhere. And as my foreign policy colleague uh, Winston Peters said on this very platform when he visited last year to open uh, the embassy, free societies need to support each other. There are not many of us in the world and it's, and it's a precious uh, commodity, well, it's a precious set of values that we all carry and we need to help each other carry them. So I'm pleased that we're finally making progress towards completing a truly progressive and high quality New Zealand European Union, FTA, uh, which brings me to some other issues that we uh, operate together with on the world, and that's championing free trade, open markets, and delivering to that ambition. By doing so, we open up new opportunities for business and we diversify their market risks and the risks of our own economy. The negotiations themselves were launched only in June last year. Uh, they've been in uh, preparatory talks for much, much longer. Uh, and uh, the, the background work that was done is why the outgoing Commission President Juncker uh, is hopeful that we can conclude an agreement this year. This is our number one, but not only, but not only trade priority. Uh, of course, it's important that we get the right type of agreement, one that truly makes a difference for businesses. That type of uh, agreement will lift Irish companies in New Zealand and Kiwi companies looking to make Ireland their European home. It'll bring us closer together by growing trade and investment, which will create opportunities for Irish expe uh, exporters like those who accompanied Minister Humphreys to New Zealand last month. Companies like CombiLift, who are breaking into the New Zealand market by supplying ports with critical infrastructure, their first sojourn into the southern hemisphere. Other Irish-grown companies like Fexco and Westbourne IT have chosen New Zealand as their entry point into the Asia-Pacific. There are some complexities in the uh, EU negotiation, and I, I don't need to tell you that. Um, I haven't come across a trade negotiation that doesn't have them. We've all got sensitivities of different sorts in every agreement. Uh, some New Zealand producers and businesses get a mixed reaction from our European friends from for simply wanting to ex export the same products to you that you trade freely with us. Uh, uh, this is despite the large trade surplus Ireland and Irish agriculture currently enjoys with New Zealand. But I'm confident that these sensitive issues can be managed while still achieving a very high quality agreement. In this era of increasingly illiberal policies and the retreat to small-minded protectionism, if the EU doesn't lead in carving out forward thinking and progressive new trade deals with important partners and like-minded friends like New Zealand, then I'm deeply concerned what the whole future holds for global trade more generally. However, I'm an optimist. I believe we can both get to a decent outcome in the European negotiation bilaterally, but I also think that uh, um, there are, there, that 
wh where does my confidence come from? Uh, well, we've actually got very experienced negotiators on the case on both sides here. We both have to um, do very well to protect our interests in this uh, very competitive world. Um, they're very good at what they do and they've managed transitions very successfully for our respective uh, countries uh, in the past. Uh, in the past few years we've seen both of our countries conclude agreements that represent markets with a sizeable bulk of G GDP, with the focus increasingly shifting to countries where we're actively excluded from markets. Uh, I think the NZEU FTE will ensure that we put that discussion to bed. But I have further um, uh, uh, hope driven from the fact that we both share a desire to put sustainability at the centre of agreements. For example, uh, we need trade agreements not to derogate from important environmental and labour laws. And we both know how to do that. We need to support the credibility and robustness of the Paris Agreement and to take and advocate for ambition climate action to help keep the 1.5 degree temperature limit within reach. We need to tackle environmentally harmful subsidies, subsidies that put more CO2 into the environment or lead to overfishing. I find it astounding that despite the terrible problems that we've got with overfishing around the world, some countries are still subsidising their fleets. To, there's no problem. Still subsidising their fleets to, uh, to fish illegally. Uh, we need to promote uh, the trade in products and services and goods that, are, uh, that uh, assist the environment by giving them preferential uh, trade status. And a truly groundbreaking agreement can make a difference on our shores, certainly, but it also spurs others. And in this way, our tri trade priorities contribute to tackling to the second and frankly more existential global challenge, which is climate change. We need all the tools we can muster. Achieving the Paris Agreement's goals requires economic, economic transformation on a large scale. Uh, the flip side of that is also the economic opportunity that comes from those who lead. I'm visiting Dublin when climate legislation is before the New Zealand uh, Parliament following uh, the release of Ireland's all-government climate action plan to tackle climate breakdown. We've both taken some bold decisions. In New Zealand, we've uh, stopped the allocation of new areas to, uh, of offshore areas to new oil uh, and gas exploration, despite being very prospective, because we don't think responsibly they can be developed. We're working to achieve a 100% renewable electricity uh, generation within 15 years. We've gone from 64% to 85% renewables in the last 10 years. We can, we've shown how it can be done. We've got a zero carbon bill that mandates methane reductions of 10% by 2030 and between 24 and 40, uh, uh, 40, I forget whether it's 44 or 47%, I think it's 47% by 2050 uh, for the agricultural sector. So we're taking uh, fossil methane, which is released from mines, be they coal mines or uh, natural gas or oil exploration, to zero. But in respect of uh, um, biogenic methane, we're promising uh, substantial reductions of 10% by 2030 and between 24 and 47% by 2050. There's still uncertainty of the science around that. And we're taking all other gases to net zero, all CO2 and the HFCs and other uh, minor gases. Uh, as well as nitrous oxide. We're creating a legging, legally binding objective uh, to limit global warming to no more than 1.5 uh, degrees of Celsius. We've got a target to plant a billion trees in the next 10 years, and we've got a commitment to a just transition for those industries and those who work in them who are affected by our journey to a low emissions future. These commitments mean that by 2050, New Zealand will be making no contribution to global warming. We'll be one of the first countries in the world that actually achieves that, in my opinion. In Ireland, uh, you've got a four-fold increase in the carbon tax to 80 euros a tonne, uh, and that's part of your efforts to redouble or to double renewable energy generation to 70% by 2030. Your intentions to phase out the sale of uh, petrol and diesel cars uh, include pushing for more zero emissions vehicles uh, in the immediate future. 
you're working towards a more ambitious 2050 objective of achieving net zero emissions. These are very laudable uh, uh, ambitions. Many varied policy levers will need to be pulled to drive the transformation to a low emissions, climate resilient economy. Uh, and it sits in New Zealand along other environmental objectives that we have. And luckily, most of them reinforce each other, whether it's biodiversity or improving water quality. New Zealand rivers are still very clean by international standards, but we have suffered a degradation of water quality caused by increasing nitrate levels from intensive forms of agriculture. And we, it was a big election issue at the last election, so we're taking measures to remedy those, uh, those issues, to, to stop that decline and, and to rejuvenate those water bodies that have been uh, degraded. I don't want to overemphasise how degraded they are because people think they sound really dirty. They're actually still cleaner than most of the rivers in the world. But the trend has been wrong and we want to reverse the trend. Uh, so many of these issues that we face globally, whether it's plastics in the sea or greenhouse gas emissions, now transcend borders and no one country can fix them alone. International action and commitment are needed to achieve the results that we want. Uh, at present, the, ministry, the New Zealand Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Trade is seeking high, high ambition provisions on climate change in our, every FTA that we've got under negotiation. We're leading international efforts for fossil fuel subsidy reform. Uh, it's crazy, some of the subsidies that effectively discourage renewables, relatively, uh, uh, including at the World Trade Organization ahead of the June 2020 ministerial conference. We're working to build a coalition of countries taking action to mitigate agricultural emissions through the Global Research Alliance on Greenhouse Gases, and our first partner in that in the world was Ireland, uh, and we jointly chair that at the moment. Uh, we're funding work by the OECD on, on uh, carbon leakage risks in jurisdictions that include a price on carbon in their economies, including for agriculture, and we're engaging in the UNF C work streams that touch on trade policy. Through our engagement in APEC, we're putting sustainability issues on the agenda in the Asia-Pacific's preeminent trade and economic forum. As things stand, there are a host of additional trade-related policy actions which could contribute meaningfully to combating climate change. These include further liberalisation of trade and climate-friendly technologies, including both goods and services, uh, concrete action on reforming subsidies for fossil fuels, probably should say firm action rather than concrete action given the embedded emissions. Uh, fisheries uh, and also reforming subsidies for fisheries and other harmful environmental subsidies. And we also promote the development of uh, international carbon markets with environmental integrity. So we look uh, for the most effective way to advance all of these issues. Both New Zealand and uh, Ireland as agricultural pressures also face challenges that are unique to our communities like tackling on-farm emissions, also keeping our farms disease-free uh, whilst we also protect the environment. We're working together on these issues through initials like the Global Research Announce, uh, Alliance that I mentioned, uh, particularly through the Livestock Research Group. At last year's uh, climate conference, New Zealand and Ireland worked together to convene a three-day event which was well attended by other countries, focused on trying to achieve this triple win of reducing agricultural emissions while we increase productivity uh, and strengthening resilience, strengthen resilience to climate impacts. Uh, it was uh, relevant and, so, and it was well received, so our officials are now working together on a possible follow-up. New Zealand's co-leading with China, the nature-based solutions pillar of the United Nations Secretary General's Climate Change Summit to be held in September in New York. Amongst its deliverables, the pillar will seek political commitment to reducing food system emissions, underscoring the need for community and private sector engagement, emphasising the need for practical policy and practical implementation targets themselves don't reduce emissions. Under the auspices of that pillar, pillar New Zealand has proposed a new agricultural initiative focused on investment and strengthening developing countries' ability to monitor agricultural greenhouse gases, to increase on ambitions on agriculture within nationally determined contributions, and to mobilise investment in agricultural mitigation research. We will call upon countries such as Ireland to come on board. It's a weighty agenda, uh, and understandably, given the shortness of time, I've only got 
time to touch on a lot of these issues, but suffice it to say, New Zealand and Ireland work very closely together. We've got some big challenges before us, but I'm confident that we can help improve the world as we work on them together. And I'm happy to answer questions on anything.